Okay, today I want to talk to you about what the Bible calls the sin of gluttony. Now I can say, in all my years of being saved and being raised in uh, church buildings, I don't recall ever hearing a sermon on gluttony. And, um, and I don't specifically try to go after sermons that nobody else has ever preached or anything, you know, for effect or something. But uh, there's just a lot of sins that a lot of the brethren just are not willing to talk about because it offends people, then the tithing goes down, you know, and we wouldn't want that. But uh, obesity right now is a very, very big problem in America. And, you know, you really don't need to see charts or statistics or I don't have any facts printed out or anything on obesity. You can pretty much see it when you go out in public. A lot of people, you know, a very large number of people are overweight to the to the point of being unhealthy overweight if you're 10 or 20 pounds overweight well you still should get that taken care of but not going to be a huge deal but when you start getting 40 50 pounds 100 200 pounds overweight you're not doing too good and especially as a christian gluttony is a sin because what gluttony is it is not taking care of the flesh, not putting the flesh down, bringing the flesh down. Webster's 1828 Dictionary defines gluttony as a noun, excess in eating, extravagant indulgence of the appetite for food, luxury of the table, their sumptuous gluttonies and gorgeous feasts, or voracity of appetite. So gluttony simply just means overeating, is what that thing means. Now, of course, it's not just overeating, it's also under-exercising which we're going to look at in this study. You see, I'm not going to just come down and, and if you are overweight and slam you and, and attack you and put you down and belittle you, I'm not going to do that. I'm actually going to give you solutions, ways that you can lose weight. Now, you might not think this, but uh, I've actually lost weight and had to lose weight. I was about, I lost about 40 pounds the first year of my marriage because my wife put me on a brand new type of a, a diet. And you go, oh, what is it? The Atkins diet or the, you know, some of these other ones? Uh-uh, no. Uh, the two of us actually learned what I would call the biblical diet, the true scriptural diet. And what I'm going to tell you is, I'm not going to leave you hanging and leave you in suspense. The true scriptural diet is a whole foods diet. In other words, no low fat. And you go, Whoa, wait a second here. You lost weight eating fatty foods? Uh-huh. Yeah. You see, when you eat food that God makes, that's as close to being natural as possible, you know, without all the food additives and everything else, which we're going to talk about in this study. If you eat food that God makes as close to being raw as possible, you'll actually be very healthy. And I'm going to talk about that as we continue in this study. I'm not advocating vegetarianism. I wouldn't advocate that. I'm not going to advocate uh, a lot of these other fad diets or pills or whatever else. If you just live by the Bible, you'll be in good shape. And I'm going to show you the scriptures today that talk about the true biblical way to stay fit. But let's start out here. Let's talk about gluttony. All right. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18. We'll start out there. And as I stated, uh, this diet that I've been on has really only been a recent thing. It's not a, you know, something I've had now for uh, 30 years, 40 years or something, and it's really worked good for me. You know, no. Um, it's actually something that's only been about a year. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my diet and my health because I had health problems and uh, they've gone away now because I've returned to a scriptural diet. But we're going to show or talk about this as we continue. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 18. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him and will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out of the out under the elders of his city and under the gate of his place. 
And they shall say unto the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. Now look at this. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Hmm. And all the men of his city shall uh, stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put away evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Kind of would be a powerful incentive back there in the Old Testament to obey your parents and, uh, and you know, not overeat and not get drunk. You know, if you're a youth and you're, you're doing that kind of thing, you get taken to the gates of the city and you get stoned to death. Hmm. I bet you obesity wasn't a problem back then. <laughs> I can pretty much guarantee it. But you see something there that the Bible ties gluttony in with stubbornness and rebellious. The sins of stubbornness and rebellion. Those sins are tied in with gluttony. Now, if you are obese, where you are more than just 5, 10, 15 pounds overweight, you're actually extremely overweight. I can tell you right now, your problem is stubbornness, not willing to eat the right foods, not willing to exercise like you should, and you're rebelling against those same things as well. Okay? Gluttony is a sin. There's no question about that. It's not, well, this happened to me unfortunately. I woke up one morning and I was 100 pounds overweight. No, it's been a process of overeating and under-exercising. Okay? And as a Christian, if you're getting offended by this, you need to check yourself and check your relationship with the Lord and you need to say, do I want to continue in this life of being overweight? Do I want to continue to live like this? Or do I want to lose the weight and keep it off? I'm not talking about a fad diet where you lose all your weight in two weeks or something like that and uh, and then you know you're you go back and you you know uh, uh I'm talking about a lifestyle change a lifestyle change that will enable you to live a very healthy life and stay healthy and actually enjoy what you're eating all right stay with me here Okay, next we're going to go. That was the very first reference to gluttony, by the way, in the Bible, or glutton. Um, go next to t Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs 23, verse 19. Now, notice there in Deuteronomy 21, what was the main problem? It was the father and mother. They were saying, our son is stubborn, he's rebellious, he won't listen to us, he's disobedient. You know, that's why he's a drunk, that's why he's a glutton. Okay? So it's tied in with, it starts out because a child rebels against their parents. Proverbs chapter 23. We're going to start out here in verse 19. Read down to verse 25. Hear thou, my son, and be wise. And guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine bibbers, among riotous eaters of flesh. For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. So you see it there again. You know, it's drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. It's kind of like saying he's lazy. You know, you come to poverty. Not a good thing. Verse 22. Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. Buy the truth and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. Now what's the New Testament tie-in with all this? Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 through 3 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise. And what's the promise? Verse 3, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. Now, I'm going to tell you a scientific fact right now. Gluttonous men and women do not live long on the earth. You get out of shape to the point where you're 50 or more pounds overweight, 
you are going to have all kinds of problems with your health. You're going to develop things like diabetes. You're going to have heart problems. Um, it's bad to get overweight. And it also makes you feel very, very, very sluggish. And you, I just don't feel like getting up and doing anything. I, uh, you know. And I was, you know, overweight, getting overweight there when we first got married, my wife and I. And, you know, I was kind of getting sluggish. And I didn't have the energy, you know, that I now have. And I can tell you right now with this diet that I'm on, I'm probably in better shape physically than I was in my 20s. And I'm going to be 38 years old, you know, July the 7th, which as you're watching this is probably today, you know, Sunday, July the 7th. So, you know, I'm not a, a young little whippersnapper anymore. I'm getting up there in years. But the point is, you can feel very, very good and very energetic and not be on some kind of a ridiculous, absurd, you know, low calorie diet. Okay, now, if you, you know, are really extremely overweight and you need to come down bring your weight down pretty quickly, well then maybe you should do the low calorie thing somewhat. We'll talk about this in a little bit, but there's a better way to maintain good health. See, I'm, I'm, I'm working it up so you have to watch the whole sermon so you get to the end, you know. Of course, here on YouTube, you just skip forward if you want to skip all the scripture. <laughs> Don't do that. But continuing here. Now, was there a man in scripture was any man in Scripture called gluttonous? This is very interesting. Matthew chapter 11. Was there ever a man that was accused of being gluttonous? Matthew 11, verse 16. There aren't really that many references in the Bible, your King James Bible, to gluttony or being gluttonous. But I'm going to show you here. Matthew chapter 11, verse 16 through 20. It says, But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and ye have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath a devil. Now look at this. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of her children. Then began he to abrade the cities, wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Hmm, there's that repentance word again. You know, but what was going on there? Well, what was happening is, you had two men there that were speaking the truth. And that made them very unpopular. And so you have John the Baptist coming, and he is not eating and drinking, and they're saying, he has a devil. He's possessed with a devil. You know? Jesus Christ comes, and he's eating with publicans and sinners, and he goes to people's houses to eat, and they say, oh, look at him. He's a drunk and a glutton. <laughs> you know? Now, was John the Baptist, did he have a devil in him? No. Did Jesus Christ, was he a drunkard and a glutton? No. What was going on there? Well, the important principle to understand is, as a Christian, you know, somebody, a follower of the Lord, and of course Jesus Christ was the Lord, you will be mocked. It doesn't matter, you know, what you do. People are going to mock you. They're going to find some way to try and attack you. That's just the way it's going to be, you know. So what do you do? Follow the Lord and don't care what people think about you. Don't be a man pleaser. That's the issue there. Luke chapter 7. We'll go there next. And we're going to read the same basic thing here. Luke 7, verse 31. Okay, Luke 7, 31. And the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation, and to what are they like? They are like, an, like unto children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another and saying, We have piped unto you, and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you, and ye have not wept. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine. There it makes it a little bit more specific. And ye say, He hath a devil. 
The Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners, but wisdom is justified of all her children. So Jesus is saying these people are not wise. They're, they don't have the spirit of wisdom in them. And so don't fool with them. doesn't matter what they're saying. Okay? So those are your references to gluttony in the Bible. Now there's a few other little verses of Scripture here, but most, mostly this sermon today is going to be about, yes, about the Bible condemning the sin of gluttony, but then how do you get out of it? Okay? Because, see, it's interesting. Um, there are some people that do not have a real strong problem with lust. I'll say it that way. So it's not a, like this, I have to indulge in, in you know, pornography or something like that. They don't have a problem with it. There are some people, I'm one of them, I have absolutely no desire for alcoholic beverages. None. You know, I know some other brethren say, well, I drink some on occasion and blah, 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 whatever. I don't care anything at all about alcohol. It doesn't tempt me. Some of the brethren have a very hard time with temptation on that. But the thing that's interesting about gluttony, the sin of gluttony, we all have a desire for food. There's not one man or woman out there that never gets hungry. The question is, number one, what are you eating? Okay, that's going to be important in this study. You see, there are types of food that you can eat, and it will not satisfy your hunger, and you'll just keep eating more and more and more and more and more, and your body's going, I need nutrients. There aren't nutrients in this food. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but... So, it's important, what are you eating? But secondly, how much are you eating? See, and are you doing the kind of work that needs to be done to burn those calories, to burn that food off? That's also going to be important. Now, go to Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23. Now we're going to get into the main part of the message. First, I just wanted you to, wanted you to see there the fact that, yes, gluttony is a sin. You can't duck that. You can't say, well, I can overeat and the Lord doesn't care. The Lord made me a good eater. Uh, wrong. If you are overweight and it's affecting uh, your ability to serve the Lord, you're messing around and you need to get that weight under control. And, you know, I had a brother write me recently and he said, you know, this weight problem I have is killing me. You know, what, what do I need to do? You know, do you have any advice that you could give me? I appreciate that. I really do. You know, that shows a willingness to change. Praise the Lord for that. I know there's a brother here on YouTube, uh, Brother Beam, I think it is. Um, I saw one of his videos a while back, and uh, I'll probably I'll, I'll put the link to it down there in the description area. Um, he said actually that he, I think he weighed 300 pounds at one point in time, dropped down to 150, 150 pounds, and he does a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about here in this message. So it is possible, brethren, and if you have a weight problem. You can't serve the Lord the way you should be. I'm not saying you can't be saved. I'm not saying that, you know, people love to say that I am categorizing all sorts of people as going to hell. No. Uh, you can be saved and be obese, okay? But you're not going to live the kind of life that the Lord wants you to live. You're not going to live the kind of quality of life that He has for you. And you're running a race. And you need to be in shape. Okay, Proverbs chapter 23, verses 1 through 3 says, When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is set before or what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Okay, now notice three things. Okay? Now this is very important. For you if you want to lose weight if you want to be in good shape biblically speaking and follow a bible-based diet three things that you need to keep in mind number one you have inspection consider consider diligently what is set before thee and don't try to duck it by going to the new testament and saying whatever set before me i can eat as long as i thank god for it all right that's just ducking the issue 
That's talking about offending people, okay? That's not talking about your normal diet. You know, if you're in a foreign mission field or something like that and somebody sets down some kind of weird food in front of you and it's, and it's you know, a creature of God, you know, which there again, it's supposed to be, you know, an animal from an animal that, that God made and not some kind of, you know, weird processed food or something. But if it's set before you and you can thank God for it, well then, you know, yeah, go ahead and eat. But unless it's sacrificed to idols, you know, then you don't want to eat that either. But the fact is, now especially, you know, you've got to consider diligently. Diligently. Notice that word there. Consider diligently. That doesn't mean that's just an easy thing to do. When you're diligent about something, that means you are, you are putting some serious effort into it. Consider diligently what is set before thee. Why? Well, because there are some downright toxic things in our food today. I'm going to talk about that here as we continue in this study. Some things that I don't care if you're exercising seven days a week. If you're ingesting these foods, it's going to destroy your health. These additives that are in our food nowadays, and I had to learn about this thing. I'm going to tell you about that in just a little bit. But you have to consider diligently what is set before you today, right now. You go back 200 years ago, and this, this whole organic thing, you know, organic fruits, organic vegetables, you know, grass-fed beef and all this other stuff, you'd have gone back and said, is this, is this uh, vegetables here, are these organic? They'd have been like, huh? Well, you know, raised without GMO and without uh, fertilizers and without sprays and everything else. They'd have gone, yeah. You know, you go back to the Bible times, it was all raised that way, all naturally. You know, the, the fish that they were eating, there weren't pollutants out there in the sea like we have now. You know, Fukushima over in Japan dumping out millions of gallons, you know, of, of radioactive nuclear waste into the ocean. You know, you have to consider diligently what is set before you today, especially. Moderation. Okay, the second thing, put a knife to thy throat. If you're a man given appetite, put a knife to your throat. Now, you don't have to do that physically, but it's... It's figuratively speaking, if you are like, I want to eat more, no, you've had enough. You tell your flesh, no, you've had enough. Stop eating. And the third thing, avoid what the Bible calls deceitful meat. Now, there's a lot of diff different types of deceitful meat out there. Some really, really, really bad stuff. So you have inspection, moderation, and avoid. Okay? Those three things right there, if you want to be healthy as a Christian, you're going to have to practice those three things. Inspect what you're going to eat. Eat it in moderation. And if it's a bad thing, you need to avoid it. Don't just say, well, you know, maybe just this once I'll eat this bag of Doritos. Or maybe I just this once I'll eat this or drink this thing of soda or whatever else. You say, oh, now, come on, now, Brian, you can't take away my Doritos and soda. Well, that depends on how much you want to be in shape. You see, if you want to be in shape, you're going to have to make some sacrifices. If you want to be in good health, you know, not be sick all the time, not have headaches all the time, you know. See, we have a problem here in America, and it is people want to sin, and then when they are paying the consequences of their sin, they say, how can I get out of this? And it's the same thing with food. People want to eat junk food, and then when they're paying the consequences of that junk food, poor health, then they say, the health care system will take care of me. It's not supposed to be that way. You see, real Christian life is about prevention. Live in ways that prevent you from sinning. Live in ways that prevent you from getting sick. Instead of saying, I'll just do what I want, and then when I get sick, I want a cure right away. That's not the Bible method of health. The Bible method of health is prevention. Okay? So inspection. Okay? The question that you need to ask yourself when you are going to eat is, if I eat lots of what is before me, will it cause me to gain weight? Okay? Vegetables and fruits. Now, eating a lot of these will not hurt you at worst, you know, the worst case scenario, if you eat a lot of vegetables and fruits especially, 
you might get some loose bowels. All right, got to take a trip to the bathroom very quickly. Okay, that's the worst thing that can happen to you. What about meats and nuts? Now, will overeating that be a problem? Well, that really depends on what you're going to be doing during the, during the day. You see, one of the biggest lies that's out there right now is this thing of red meat is evil. I don't agree with that. I don't believe that red meat is bad for you. What I believe is red meat is bad for you if you aren't going to work it off. If you're not willing to do physical labor, then yeah, eating a lot of meat, a lot of nuts, yeah, it's going to be bad for you. But you know, if you ever want to look at some pictures, excuse me, of old time loggers back in the days before they had chainsaws, guys fell in trees with, with cross cut saws and axes. I mean, they're swinging that axe all day long, chop, chop, and then they're, they're working the crosscut saw. Those guys were skinny as a rail, and yet they ate four different types of meat for breakfast. Sausage, pork chops, you know, steaks, bacon, every morning for breakfast. I mean, them guys ate like, you know, like they say, like a horse. I mean, they, they ate a lot of food, but see, they burned it off. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you have a lot of physical work to do, don't eat fruits and vegetables alone. Why? Fruits and vegetables are good. They're very cleansing. They will get a lot of junk out of your body. They're very good for you. You have a lot of vitamins and minerals. But fruits and vegetables are not going to sustain your energy if you have physical labor to do. You're going to wear out in about an hour. That energy is just going to be gone and you're just going to be dragging along. Uh, you know, you don't want to do that. Okay? But if you have a lot of driving to do or something like that, where you're not going to be moving around a lot physically and, or you work at a computer and whatever, well, you still need to eat meat, but don't eat a whole lot of it. Why? You're not active. You're not active enough. Eat more fruits and vegetables. See, you regulate uh, your food intake according to your lifestyle. See? You don't just say, I'll eat whatever I feel like eating, no matter what kind of life I live. No, it's a bad idea. So you gotta, you got to figure out how this body works. All right? God created our bodies. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And you need to figure out how your body works. What about grains? Well, they're good, depending on the type. And a very easy little rhyme for you to remember is, the whiter the bread, the quicker you're dead. Okay, when they bleach flour and they take all the nutrients out of it and everything and all the whole grain and all that out, and you know, don't believe any prop propaganda out there, oh, white bread's perfectly fine. No, it is not. It's very, very bad. It's just, it's all kinds of artificial things and just, you know, you'd be better off just picking up a piece of cardboard and eating it. You'd probably get more roughage from it. Don't mess with white bread. Okay, uh, what about dairy? Well, here's another controversial issue, uh, which I'm going to be talking about as we continue. But raw dairy products are excellent. You say, what did you say there? I said raw dairy products. R-A-W, raw. Okay, you see, dairy products have bacteria in them. <gasps> oh, no, bacteria. Oh, no, actually, good bacteria. You see, there are good bacteria that your body needs. Enzymes that go down into your stomach that help to break down your food. All right? And when you don't have those enzymes in your stomach, a lot of times you'll develop food allergies. Now, here's where my, one of my little stories comes in. Back when I was 17 years old, well, I'll go way back even farther back than that. As a boy, my parents knew a farm, a dairy farm, and... Back in those years, we were, able, we, we were able, I'll get it out yet, we were able to actually go to the dairy farm and buy milk that was basically, they milk the cow, it goes into the tank, and it goes through some filters and stuff like that, but that milk, all it did was cool down. It went from the warm cow through the, the filters to get out any kind of dirt and went in, and it was cooled down in this big stainless steel vat. And we'd go there, we had one gallon milk jugs, 
glass milk jugs. We'd go and they had these little scoops and we'd fill them up. And I remember, you know, carrying these big one gallon milk jugs out to the car, you know, as just a little boy and I'd be carrying these things out. And then my parents would pay the farmer and, and everything was fine. So for the most, the majority of my life as a little boy, uh, I was raised on raw milk straight from the cow. I mean, there was no pasteurization to it at all. And, you know, you, you get up in the morning and the raw milk, the cream settles to the top. You get this thick layer of cream and you got to shake the, the milk up to, to get it to, to blend again. And that's what homogenized milk gets, takes that away. But anyhow, we, that's what I was raised on. Never had a broken bone of any kind. Was in all kinds of different accidents with my bicycle and fell down things and later on got into dirt bikes. And I, I mean, I wrecked bad a number of times. Never broke a bone. And none of my brothers and sisters did either. So, and we, you know, we lived in the country. We lived a very rough, you know, had a rough childhood as far as, you know, we weren't little dainty, little sitting on satin pillows or anything. But anyhow, this farm burned down eventually. And so we weren't able to get our raw milk anymore. And my parents just figured they were raised on raw milk. You know, we were raised on raw milk and they just figured, well, we'll just go to the store and buy the regular store stuff. They had no idea what pasteurized meant. Well, what pasteurization does is, I believe it's about 75 to 100 degrees, right in that area, is what they heat the milk up to. And that kills the bacteria in the milk. And then there's ultra pasteurized, which is about 100 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit. They heat the milk up and it kills everything in it. And you say, oh, that's wonderful, it kills the bacteria. Uh, let me ask you a question, if you believe that. Um, do you think that they strain the bacteria out? The, uh, you know, microscopic bacteria that's in that milk, what do they do with that dead bacteria? See, you're either going to drink live bacteria in your milk or you're going to drink dead bacteria. And if you're drinking store-bought pasteurized milk, you are drinking dead bacteria. And that goes into your body and your body goes, what on earth do I do with this? And so you develop all kinds of problems. That's why people have things like uh, lactose intolerance and, and all kinds of other problems because they're drinking dead milk. And your body is saying, I don't know what to do with this. And there's a whole lot more I could get into on this. And I understand, here again, I understand a lot of states have banned the sale of raw milk. And some states have, are trying to repeal it and everything else. Uh, you'll have to check into your local laws and stuff See if you can find a uh, um, raw milk distributor. What's, what's the website? Weston A. Price. Yeah. Weston A. Price uh, dot com or dot O-R-G. Sorry. Uh, Weston A. Price dot O-R-G. Again, we'll put links down in the description box. Um, and you can find a raw milk distributor in your area. And I'm, here's the point of my story. You say, well, come on, Brian. What's the big deal? When I was 17 years old, I, I guess I stopped farm milk when I was about 10. By the time I was 17, I remember I was working at this uh, place and I went out and I had carrot sticks and a banana in with my sandwich and everything else when I was, you know, working at a place building boats. And I went out and I'm eating and all of a sudden I was like, whoa, I don't feel too good and ended up throwing it up. And this began this thing with me that I would just, anytime I ate fruits and vegetables, I would throw it up. And for the next 20 years, essentially, I was not able to eat any fruits and vegetables raw. They had to be cooked. And it just kept getting worse and worse and worse. I mean, there was a while I could eat strawberries, and then that went away. I'd, I'd get sick on them. And, and, I just, and it was affecting my health. And my health was going down and down and down and down and down along with it. Then I got married and we started to experiment with things and we started to look into and research the thing of natural food and whole foods and things like that. In other words, stuff that is as unprocessed as possible. All right. And I started to drink raw milk again. Uh, found some where the one place we were living, then we moved to someplace else. And we were driving an hour and a half, two hour drive one way to get raw milk at one point in time. You say, is it really worth it? Yes, I can tell you it's worth it. 
because within a few months of drinking raw milk, my food allergy went away. And right now, I can eat any fruit, I can eat any vegetable without any side effects. None. Why? Because I needed that helpful bacteria back in my system again. I needed those enzymes back in that come from raw milk. You know, and I had a, I had a guy that write to me the one time, because I, I made a statement about raw milk, and he said, he said, well, you know, raw milk is just, it's, it's pus or something like this. And I thought, and I said, okay. And he's like, it's, you shouldn't be drinking that stuff. It's, it's bad and whatever else. And I said, all right. I said, uh, could you please give me one verse of scripture that talks about milk in a positive light and give me one verse of scripture where it says milk is to be heated before you drink it, which is all pasteurization is. You could take raw milk and heat it up and you kill it, you know. And the guy, of course, wrote back and he said, well, I never thought of it that way. Well, yeah, you know, we're supposed to have raw milk as part of our diet. Unfortunately, many people do not have raw milk as part of their diet and they have all kinds of sickness issues as a result. So dairy products are very, very good. And if you have food allergies, I can tell you a lot of your food allergies are going to actually be reversed or even stopped just by adding raw milk or raw milk products raw milk type yogurt or, or there's kefir, things like this, and it's delicious. That's the best part. Again, it's not, it's not this thing of I got to live on, you know, some kind of uh, uh, grass or something like it. No, no, it's very, very good. Now, is raw milk fattening? Yeah, sure. You see, because there's a tissue in your body that is made up almost entirely of fat. And if that tissue is not receiving enough fat, you're going to start having shrinking in this tissue. You say, what tissue is that? The brain. And a lot of people are actually experiencing memory loss and all kinds of problems because their brain is not getting enough fat. You see, low-fat diets are not actually the Bible way. I didn't say lean. See, lean. there are lean meats out there that are good, but what I'm saying is when you have things that they're chemically taking fat out of milk or meat or other things like that, you don't want that. You don't want to mess with it. Because, see, they're taking the fat out and they're putting other things in, which we're going to talk about here as we continue. Okay. What about processed foods? We looked, we looked at uh, vegetables and fruits. We looked at meats and nuts. Grains are good. Dairy is good. But what about processed foods? Okay, things that you get. And when I say when I say processed foods, I'm talking about the stuff that's already pre-cooked. That all you got to do is go home, put it in the microwave, or put it in your toaster oven, or whatever else, and it's ready in five minutes. You know, it comes in a box, a pretty box with all that's nicely screen, you know, printed and everything else, and it's got nice graphics on it. All that's the stuff you want to avoid, and avoid it like the plague. You say, why is that? Well, now we're going to get into the thing of harmful additives. And again, a lot of you, it's, it's, this, is, this stuff might seem overwhelming at first. It seemed overwhelming to us when we first you know, got married and we went, moved into this diet. And it will get frustrating at times because you're going to go through the grocery store and you're going to see these chemicals in almost everything to the point of it's, it's absurd. But if you want to live the kind of a life and you want to have the kind of health that the Lord has for you and you don't want to live in pain and you don't want to have diabetes and you don't want to have all this other stuff, I'm telling you what, this is what you have to do. This is the stuff that you have to look out for. First of all, you have high fructose corn syrup. Okay, high fructose corn syrup is refined. It's a chemical essentially. And what the thing does is it spikes your insulin levels. And so you keep doing this to yourself. Obviously, you're, you're going to have a hard time losing weight if you're getting all this, these huge amounts of sugar coming into you. But also, it can lead to diabetes. And they've even you know, found mercury in high fructose corn syrup. I mean, it is toxic. It is very, very bad. And I'm going to tell you right now, brethren, it is frustrating. When you go someplace, you go to a store, High fructose corn syrup is in everything. I mean, you'll see it in pretzels. You'll see it in mayonnaise. You'll see it. It's, soda is almost totally high fructose corn syrup. And by the way, when you look at the ingredients on the back, 
the higher up high fructose corn syrup is in the ingredients list, the more of it there is in that product. Okay, so a lot of times you'll pick up soda and it'll say high fructose corn syrup as the first ingredient. You're drinking almost pure sugar. And your body, it's just like, you know, your body's going, okay, I want to sleep. And somebody comes up to you and takes cymbals and goes, clang, beside your head. You're not going to be doing too much sleeping. And that's the way your body, your body's going, okay, I want to function normally here. And, oh, what am I going to do with all this sugar? Just, it shocks your body. And a lot of times what your body is doing is your body's taking these chemicals and just going, I don't know what to do with this. I'll just stick it over here into fat. Very bad. But unfortunately, high fructose corn syrup also has other names. They're very, very deceptive. Corn syrup, modified corn starch, modified food starch. And they were even trying to uh, come to the FDA and say that they wanted to call it corn sugar. But the FDA said no to that, at least for now. You know, maybe if there's enough money that changes hands, the FDA will change their mind. I don't know. But the point is, avoid things with high fructose corn syrup. Okay? And you can do it. All right, we ingest almost no high fructose corn syrup anymore. You say, but, but uh, all my favorite brands of Doritos, you know, have it in. Well, then don't eat Doritos. All my favorite brands of soda have it in. Then don't drink soda. If you can't find something that does not have high fructose corn syrup in it, don't mess with it. You want to lose weight, don't you? You want to live the kind of a life that God would want you to live, don't you? That's the issue here, brethren. How bad do you want good health? See, consider diligently what's set before thee. It's going to take diligence on your part. Weight loss and good health are not easy things. Okay, they are once you know what to do, you know, and once you get into the lifestyle, but getting into it is tough sometimes. And I'll tell you, it was tough for, for us. The next one, MSG, monosodium glutamate. Okay, this is going to be found in a lot of your salty type of things. Doritos, I know Doritos across the board, I think, have MSG in them. Most of your potato chips have it in. A lot of your canned uh, soups. Uh, you can get some canned soups that are natural and whatever else. They don't have MSG. They don't have high fructose corn syrup. But most canned foods will have MSG. And... Uh, Again, MSG leads to all kinds of health problems. You can, you know, some of the stuff you can look up on your own if you don't want to take my word for it, that's fine. But MSG is something that you should also avoid. Uh, real, real, real bad stuff. Continuing, artificial food dyes. Now, this is an, an article here I have. Found in practically everything we eat, cake mixes, sports drinks, cheese, candy, and even macaroni and cheese. Oh, no, Brother Brian, not macaroni and cheese. You can't take away my macaroni and cheese. Well, <laughs> if you want to be healthy, yes, I can. But here's the idea. You can get macaronis, and you can get good cheese and make your own. But that sounds like it's going to take a while. Yeah. Uh-huh. Kind of like reading the King James Version and getting a blessing from taking some time to study rather than just a quick little couple seconds in a devotional book or some kind of thing, easy book, you know, to read. No, you see, if you want to be well fed, it's going to take a little bit of time. It's going to take some time to prepare real, true, good food. Why it's dangerous? Artificial food dyes. Artificial dyes are made from chemicals derived from petroleum, which is also used to make gasoline, diesel fuel, asphalt, and tar. Isn't that wonderful? Artificial dyes have been linked to brain cancer, nerve cell deterioration, and hyperactivity in children, just to name a few. If you have children and they are hyper and bouncing off the walls, maybe you need to look at what you're giving them. If you're giving them with things like red, you know, dyes and stuff, red, what is it, red 40, and, and you know, and, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of them. I don't, I don't know how those memorized, but you look at the ingredients, if there's all these collars followed by a number, uh, that thing's got artificial food dyes in it. But here's the really shocking part. Artificial food dyes and foods with them in are banned in Norway, Finland, Austria, France, and the UK. But not in America. Land of the free and home of the slaves. I mean, uh, brave. 
See? You see, as we continue through this thing, you're going to see that this is actually not just a coincidental type of a thing. There's a thing called eugenics, which is population control. You know, and I do believe that there is a satanic agenda to make people unhealthy so that they can go, get them into the medical establishment to get their money and keep you very unhealthy because people that are unhealthy aren't very good at resisting and they're easier to control. Sick people are easier to control 100% of the time. Continuing, Olestra or Olean found in fat-free potato chips, corn chips, and french fries. Now see here, here's where the deception starts to come in with the food manufacturers. They'll tell you, don't buy that MSG chips, those chips that have MSG in them, we'll give you all natural fat-free chips. And it's not even flavored with the harmful animal fats out there. We use Olean or Olestra. And you go, wow, that must be good for me then. Why it's dangerous. Created by Procter & Gamble as a substitute for cooking oil, Olestra robs your body of its ability to absorb vitamins. Fun side effects include cramps and leaky bowels. Gotta love that. Where it's banned, the UK and Canada. These foods are banned in other countries. Here's another good one. Brominated vegetable oil. Found in sports drinks and citrus flavored sodas. Most most uh, popular one there would be Mountain Dew. Mountain Dew is deadly toxic. I'm talking bad. <laughs> Real bad for you. Why it's dangerous. Bromine is a chemical used to stop carpets from catching on fire. So you can see why drinking it may not be the best idea. Um, brominated vegetable oil is linked to major organ system damage, birth defects, growth problems, schizophrenia, and hearing loss. And it's banned in over 100 countries, but not in America. Here in America, you know, you can eat and drink poison and look trendy while doing it. You know, do the do, man. Hey, dude, you know, I just love my Mountain Dew. <laughs> yeah, you're drinking poison and you're killing yourself. You know, and, and the Lord has designed our bodies to be very, very strong and we're able to fight off disease and things. But after a while, brethren, it's going to start to catch up with you. You can laugh at me and stuff. And hey, hey, let me just explain something. For years and years and years, I was going to fast food restaurants and getting soda with my value meals, you know. I'd do that thing probably every other night, you know. I mean, I just, I was eating fast food like crazy. And when I was in my early 20s, I, my appendix burst. And I was in the hospital, you know, for a couple days, and it was, it was pretty bad. I almost died from it because I was working in a toxic factory, and I was eating fast food and just living very, very unhealthy. And I, when I went to get out, the doctor who had done the surgery, he told me, he said, don't eat fast food for about three months. And I thought, why can't, why can't I eat fast food? What's it have to do with my appendix bursting? Oh, I found out. But, you know, you say, well, then you never ate fast food again after that. Well, I wish I could say that, but no. I eat fast food. All right? So I'm not some ultra-natural health type of a guy that's just lived healthy all my life, and I don't know what it's like to be tempted by fast food and soda. Oh, no. I've had those temptations. I had years and years and years. When I worked at the place building boats, I'd buy a 24-pack of Dr. Pepper. And on my break, I'd drink three or four of them or four cans you know three times a day so you know don't say oh Brian you don't know what it's like to be tempted oh yeah I do yeah I do and I know that to be in good health and you know it, it didn't seem to bother me when I was in my early 20s but as I got older all of a sudden I'm having headaches all the time migraine headaches and I'm getting sick a lot and just no energy and just weak and depressed all the time yeah it's because I spent years and years and years destroying my health and if you spent years and years destroying your health, it's not going to come back the first week. You're going to have to stick with this thing. Okay? And I want to tell you right now, it is worth sticking with. You'll feel amazing 